A man and his lawyer walk into the courtroom and stand before the judge. The judge asks, what does the defendant plea? The lawyer replies, your honor, my client pleads trans guilty. The judge has a puzzled look on his face. The lawyer then says, he identifies as an innocent man. Today I want to talk a little bit about the importance of innocence and reclaiming it. But in order to talk about innocence, one must look a little bit deeper and beyond where innocence finds its definition. And in order to find a definition of innocence, one must first recognize it as a virtue. A working definition for virtue would be a good habit that benefits the self and society. Innocence benefits the self and society when within reason one is without guilt and is justly received. One source where you can find innocence is through literature, where we see examples and even modeling of innocence. There are a couple of classics that I'd like to draw your attention to that show innocence that is so closely, fully accepted in society that it almost pains us as the reader to see the shortcomings of society in accepting the innocence of the other. One of these books is Miguel de Cervantes' classic, Don Quixote. For those of you who have not read this book as of yet, other than wholeheartedly recommending it to you now, I will try to keep my spoilers to a minimum. Don Quixote is the story of a middle-aged man from La Mancha. This man loved to read the fantastical stories of the knights errant. He is so moved by the courageous intentions and actions of these knights that he aims to embody this chivalry of old. One could say that this desire spurns from his own intentions and resonates from these great books themselves. Don Quixote goes on a journey in order to defend the weak disband their oppressors, and save his envisioned princess in distress. The central conflict, however, resonates in the setting of this novel. The ideal of a chivalric knight is a ghost or a legend of the past. There is such a disconnect from the times of the knights errant that its symbol of bravery and goodness, its sense of virtue, is incommutable to the many different people Don Quixote encounters through his own knight's errant. He thus becomes a figure of obscurity and ridicule. The second book is Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Idiot. This tale, again trying to limit spoilers, follows the curious path of Prince Mushkin, a brutally honest, filthy rich, estranged member of the almost royal upper class of 19th century Russia. The read follows Mushkin as he attempts to integrate himself amid the prim and proper social circles of Russia's most successful. Success in this setting is measured by material wealth. His trials to embody the expected persona of his confidants are ones of headache and prejudice. Soon Mushkin becomes alienated through jealousy and disapproval. In turn, this alienation reveals a number of psychological issues. Further, the conflict between Mushkin and the other characters of the book communicate a conflict between what is ideal and what is good. And these two summaries are gross understatements, I see, of the true values of these two novels. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance of these two stories in regards to bettering one's self and to better one's another. To recapture this innocence, to recapture this virtue. As though with defiance 
I will continue with a number of questions that resonate as I followed the journey of Don Quixote and Prince Mushkin. These questions include that of subjective and even objective morality. Can our objective sense of what is right and wrong, good and evil, diverge into an objective sense of right and wrong, good and evil? Other questions of purpose and reason for struggle emerge as well. Is the struggle for what is ideal the same as the struggle for what is good? I would argue that one such obstacle we face as a society would be emphasizing identity over innocence. And one such identity that is often presumed or even dangerously runs the risk of becoming prejudice is recognizing religious or non-religious identity. Can we reclaim the innocence in conversation to overcome the tripfalls of personal identity? Can recognizing and encouraging innocence lead to constructive discussion on complex religious identity conversations, especially in the classroom? I would argue the innocent learn more effectively from each other than a group of predetermined identities clashing to no end. Innocence over identity. Otherwise, we run the risk of coming to the same end as the characters I alluded to before. Their identity, or the way that they are received by society, often have labels attached that lead to no good end. Therefore, virtue, or a good habit, that improves the one's self and society cannot be obtained. One final image to share with you. An openness to those who call on us and to the many and varied signs that catch our interests from the song of the bird to the falling rain or the, or the rain that is about to drop from the darkening sky to the gentle smile of innocence in the solemn face of disapproval, to the arms open to receive, and the body stiff with refusal and fear. It is in my permanent openness to life that I give myself entirely, my critical thought, my feeling, my curiosity, my desire, all that I am. That's from Paulo Fryer. I believe as teachers, as students, in the academic world, in the educational milieu, it is crucial to reclaim the innocence in approaching such topics, in broaching such pitfalls that may arise from presumed identity. Thank you.